check. Can you hear me? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron. I work here. Um, give me one second to get my presenter view on the other monitor. Probably could have done this before. OK. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, generics, um, and specifically generating generics um, using Go Generate. Um, so when I'm working in Go, there's a problem that I run into a lot that I wanted to solve, um, which is what happens when you have a sequential, you have a couple of actions that you want to do, um, and each action could possibly fail, and you're doing like standard Go style multiple return for doing the error handling. Um, and so in my example here, I'm creating a document. Um, I want to print it to the screen or print it wherever. Um, and then if that failed, if that returned an error, I want to you know, show that probably not do anything else. Um, if it didn't fail, then I come down here and I um, try to do the next step, which is save document in this case. And then I check again for an error. Um, and then I print it out if there is one and you know, fail it if there's not. Um, so this is fine. This is like pretty standard Go. I think this is how most of the Go that I've seen written works, is you just kind of have a lot of if error equals nil. You see that kind of over and over again. And especially like sequential stuff like this, um, it gets kind of annoying. And this, this bothered me. Um, so I'll, I'm going to kind of nitpick this for a second. If you do this, you're duplicating your error handling quite a lot. Um, these two lines, if error e is not equal to nil, print error, error, like that's showing up here twice in a normal application. You'll see that like thousands and thousands of times. It just happens over and over again. Pretty much every function call that could possibly fail, you'll see that happen. Um, and that just it hurts my eyes. Um, another problem I have with this is it's hard to understand. Um, all that's really happening here, this is just two steps, right? I'm printing out a document, and then I am saving the document. That's really what I want to know. I'm doing two things, one after the other, bail out if we fail, right? Um, but even though I'm only doing two things, I can't tell that by looking at this. Like, I should be able to look at this and in a quarter of a second know exactly all the steps it's going to do, and I can't really do that with this. Um, I kind of have to read through and, and read through the if statements and stuff. And even if you've been doing Go for a while, like you get used to the if error equals nil checks and kind of becomes invisible to you, it's still like there's a lot of space my eye has to track over before like it gets to my brain. Um, so that's not super great. Um, another thing is that there's a lot of boilerplate code when you do this. Um, kind of the same thing, you know, you see the same stuff over and over again. I actually wound up copying and pasting if error equals nil and then whatever my handler function was. I would copy and paste that over and over and over again. Um, and um, I don't like copying and pasting. Um, but there is, there is one advantage to this style versus some of the other styles I'm going to look at with this talk, um, which seems kind of obvious. But um, you're going to catch any problem you have with typing at build time. So if um, I tried to you know, print out something that wasn't a document, um, that's going to happen at compile time, not a run time, um, which seems pretty obvious. But it'll contrast with some of the other stuff I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, so yeah, this is this is pretty standard uh, error handling in Go. So it's got me thinking about like, let's say I want to move some of these these points around. I've got three X's there and one check mark for, you know, the way that I'm instrumenting this. Um, I want to see if I can like wiggle some of these check marks around. Is there a different like combination of this that I can do? Um, and so one thing that I have been sort of toying with them on the side. I haven't done this in production yet, but I've started um, introducing these container types. Um, so I have a new type. It's called an optional document. Um, it has two functions on it, try. And that takes a document that actually does whatever you're going to do with your document, like print it to the screen or save it or whatever. Um, and then it has to return a document in an error. Um, it returns the document because if you need to mutate it or something, you want to like change the name or the, or the content or something like that. Um, I want the next step to get the mutated version. Um, so you return the mutated version so we can pass it along. Um, the other thing it does is I have a handle error function, um, which will, so what's going to happen here is try is going to try to do something with the document that it has inside. Um, if it succeeds, it carries on and does the next try and carries on and does the next try. If it ever gets an error back in any one of those, um, it stops calling the try functions and just drops down and falls through until it gets to a handle error. And then it calls that with the error that it got. Um, so here's the, just to make this a little bit more clear, this is the signature of what kind of function you would pass in there. Um, it's expecting a first order function. Um, so here's print document, just a signature for it, not the rest of the body, because that was too much code. 
Um, but you know, it just receives a document, returns a document in error. Pretty straightforward. It can assume that it's there. It's not a pointer or anything like that. It's just it's a straightforward value. It's got it. Um, and then the way you use this thing, um, so I created a document like I did with the first try, the first attempt. Um, and then I just call optionals.wrap document and hand it in. That's going to create a new optional. Um, and then I can sequentially call the stuff that I want to do. So I try to print a document, try to save a document, then I handle the error on it. Um, this is so much easier to understand for me. I can look at this in like, you know, a millisecond. I know everything that's going to happen to that document. Um, the only thing about it that's like at all weird is the, the wrap step, and the wrap step has the words optional wrap document. So it's a document wrapped in an optional container, which is fantastic. I love that. Um, I'm only handling the error once now. Um, so instead of having like this multiple trees and you get that kind of pyramid, it doesn't matter how many steps I have in here, I could have like 50 tries, but if all I want to do is print whatever error happened to happen to the screen, I can do that in the last step. So you just call handle error as the last thing you do, and then you print it out or panic or whatever you want to do with that. Um, which is great. You're also going to catch type problems at build time. Um, again, it seems kind of obvious, um, but you know, you can't wrap a document in the past and something that's not a document, the compiler is going to catch that, it's going to blow up. Um, so we're still good there, haven't changed that check mark. Um, but we did introduce a new X, which is that this has a, well, this is, sorry, this is the same X, but this is, this still has a lot of boilerplate. Um, and it's kind of hidden. We don't see it here um, because this, this code has been cleaned up quite a bit, um, but the optional type itself, um, there's nothing about that thing actually knows what a document is. It doesn't need to call any methods on it or anything. It's just going to save it, and then it's going to call try with it, which means that if I want to wrap something else with an optional, um, I have to re-implement the whole thing over again, and it's exactly the same code. And the only thing that changes in the second one is that I change the word document to whatever my other type is, so optional string or optional entity or optional whatever. Um, so still lots and lots of boilerplate. In fact, I wound up with more code. If you do this, you wanted more code than you had in the beginning. So we're not in any better. Um, but at least like my main.go looks great, and all my other files look terrible now, <laughs> which makes me happy. I like that. Um, so maybe I'm not done yet. I'm going to keep iterating on this. Don't like this. What else can we do? How can I change that boilerplate? Would you mind holding your questions till the end? I might answer some of the questions as we go. Thanks. Um, so let's try this. Um, this is basically the same thing, optional anything. Um, and this guy, I'm just using empty interfaces instead of a specific type. Um, still works exactly the same way. It saves a value, which is an empty interface. It calls a function you pass into try. If anything in there returns an error, then you call handle error on it. We're great. Um, same deal. Here's that same function rewritten, um, just the signature of it using empty interfaces. Um, so far, so good. Um, and even if you go to look at this thing, using it, from this level looks about the same. Um, this is really this, this particular example is exactly the same, except I changed the word document to any a couple of times. Um, so we're handling the error once. Uh, it's easy to understand. It's really simple to see what's going on here. It's also really easy to understand how the container itself works. I think pretty much any Go programmer is comfortable with empty interfaces. Um, there's not a lot of code this time. Um, so finally, I've got less code than I did in the beginning. Um, because I only have, the, have to define that optional any one time, and then anything can be assigned to an optional, uh, empty interface. Um, there's a problem, though. I've introduced a new problem. This is what I was contrasting with before. Um, if I wrap a document and then call print anything, and inside print anything, I'm doing a type assertion. So let's say I need to get like, the content out of the document, or some way, there's some way that I need to know what the type of the document is. Um, so I'll do a type assertion. That's fine when it works, but when it doesn't work, it's going to break at runtime. It's going to crash your server, or it's going to cause your program to stop working. Instead of happening in compile time, I really want to see failures happen in compile time if I can, because um, I can catch bugs a lot earlier that way. Um, so for me, that last one's a deal breaker. These other ones, like, we're getting better, um, but the fact that problems are going to come up at runtime is enough for me to just like kind of wash my hands of this and give up normally. Um, so. That seemed like a dead end when I was working on this before. Um, but there's this thing called generics. Um, and if you're not familiar with generics, I'm going to show an example in Swift because I like Swift a lot. Um, and this is really easy to read. Um, so this is, this is a pure Swift generic. Basically, we have a stack of item. And then item is the um, generic type. It's the associated type. We don't actually know when you write this what type item is going to wind up being. 
Um, essentially, what happens is the Swift compiler generates every time you use it, it generates a new version of that for whatever type it is. Um, so if I want a stack of integers, I can just say, hey, give me a stack of integers, um, and it essentially generates this. Um, so now we've got it strongly typed to integer and integer. And then same deal, if I try it again later and I use a string, I get these two classes for free, but I really only wrote that one, um, which is really cool. Um, so you get like type safety when you don't even know what the type's gonna be. You're kind of saying like, I know that's gonna be this type going in and this type going out, but that's all, um, which is neat. And it turns out that um, in Go, we can generate code too. Um, so this is Go generate. This is a comment that you would put like in your source code file. Um, and there's not a whole lot to it. Um, this is just taken straight out of the source I used for this talk. Um, you basically just give it a command and then whatever arguments, it's just, it's just run a command line tool. Um, and then Go, when you run Go generate on your files, it'll sort of like search for these comments and then it'll execute um, the code that it sees in there. Um, so this dot slash optional is a program that I wrote um, that lives in the same directory as um, the, the rest of the source for this thing. Um, and then the document is just, the, it's just an argument to that command. Um, and what this does is it takes a template. Um, and I used ERB for this, because Ruby programmer, guilty. Uh, <laughs> did this on the plane, it took me about five minutes in ERB. I spent half an hour trying to figure out if there was a Go template I could use for this, and I gave up. Um, so I use ERB for it. I'm still okay with it because you're, you're still gonna catch everything in compile time and stuff. And you know, use the language for what it's good at, and Ruby's good at generating stuff. Um, so yeah, this is a template for an optional of any type, and this looks exactly the same. If you look back at um, the Swift version of this thing, um, it looks pretty much exactly the same as stack item, except we've got like a percent equals, and that's the only thing that's different. Um, so we've got less than percent equals item, and then percent close, and it's just ERB. Um, so all the script does, basically all the script does, is it just takes document and subs it in for item in here. And whatever types you put in there, you can have it sub out for. Um, and so what I would do is if I need an optional of some particular type in a file, close to the top of the file, I just put a go generate optional and then the type that I want to have an optional for. That's all you have to do, but now it's gonna be available when you run this. Um, and then using it, um, when you're using this thing, you use it exactly the same way that you would have used the strongly typed one in our first container example. Um, this is actually just copy and pasted from that except I changed you know, two to three except for two places where I just realized I had a typo. <laughs> um, so yeah, using this thing is exactly the same as it was before. Um, so you still get all the benefits you had before. Um, you're only handling the error once. Um, there's not a lot of code because we're generating everything. The template's the only thing that's new. Um, your problems are still caught at build time. Even though the generation is done in a dynamic language, I'm still, I uh, have to compile everything that, the, that gets generated, so I'm still catching all my typing problems when I build. Um, the only problem is this is a little hard to understand. Um, if you're doing this in production, I start to get second thoughts about it um, because, first of all, Go doesn't have generics, which means that if I'm working with, uh, you know, if a Go experienced Go programmer comes onto my project, if they're not somebody who's had experience in another language that also already has generics, um, this is gonna be like a totally new concept for them. Um, and if they're not familiar with like all the gotchas that you might find in compilers of other languages, then you might be tempted to do some fancy stuff with the template generation version, um, which, you know, is kind of a, it's a garden path. Like you get to the end and realize you have to turn around, um, which I, I did a couple of times working on this talk. Um, and then if you, if you go back and look at the source for this thing, um, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to, to read the one thing. Like, this case is pretty trivial or simple, but if you're looking at the actual source thing code for this, every single line has one of these eRuby um, stamps in it. Um, and it starts to get to be like a lot of mental overhead to parse that. And so if you have to work on the actual template, um, it's pretty hard to understand. Using it is fantastic. Using it is like a joy. Um, but working on the template itself, you know, giant pain in the butt. Um, and so, for that last reason, I'm gonna say, don't use any of this stuff. <laughs> um, it was super fun to do, and it was like a really great like side hack project, and I'm actually using it myself my own, on my own projects at home, like if I write a command line utility or something like that, um, I'll use this stuff. 
Um, but this is the metric that I live by here at work. Um, and uh, using templates in Ruby to generate a generic type in Go really falls on the right half of this diagram, I think. <laughs> um, I haven't talked to any like professional Go programmers and been like, wow, that's a really great idea. I'm glad you did that. I haven't had that reaction from anybody. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I probably don't use any of that stuff. Um, and that's it. I flew through that. Um, just got a couple links. There's the source to um, the source code that I used um, writing this example. So I actually made a, a working um, example program using this technique, and all the stuff is in there. The Ruby code source is in there, and everything. Um, and then the second link is the links to the, the slides. These slides, which are things I can probably send to everybody. And that's it. Questions. Yeah. Uh, say I actually had to decide an error object or an error object, and error that's not even to say my function. Sure. Besides like having some sort of closure that allows you access to like the internal of that function that you're passing around, is there any other way I can actually get at the number of errors in the same function interface about the problem? Um so what he's asking is, um, back here when we had the um, original container type, um, which is right here, he's saying from this interface there's no way to like, something that's consuming the optional document, um, is there a way to get the error back out of it on the way back up the chain? Um, and yes, the answer is yes and no. Um, you can write synchronous code that will be able to get to that. Um, if you want to, um, so the optional document here is actually just a struct that has the error on it, and so you could just do all your sequential calls and at the end call the, get the error back out of it and pass it up. You could definitely do that. Um, if you do that, you lose some of the benefits of this, t of this style um, because um, optional document doesn't actually make a promise about when it's gonna call try or how it's gonna call try, and so you could replace this with future document or something and then use exactly the same code to make a call to a remote endpoint or something like that. Um, and so if you introduce that extra step where you actually get the error back out of it again, you've made it synchronous, and now you're saying that I must have called all the steps that I want to call by the time they get to that point. Um, and that kind of loses some of the value. You can still get that if you want to do asynchronous stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a few um, frameworks that use this sort of thing that have like a wait, which basically you know, waits for it either to get through all the steps that it has queued up, or alternatively it errors out. Yeah. Yeah, he's saying if we're using a promise framework, you can usually, you can resolve a promise and then you can wait for it to have a value available or not. And you could certainly do that with this. I'm nothing stopping you. I haven't done it um, in the source for, for this thing, um, but you could. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. What's my fallback? Um, so yeah, my fallback is the principle of least surprise, um, which is not great. But there's a lot of ways you can rewrite this so it's not as bad. I kind of made it contrived here to make it look bad. Um, so I mean, you're still going to wind up doing the same, basically the same amount of error handling you would do, but you could flatten this out and you could have guard statements after each step and that sort of thing. You're still going to have a lot of boilerplate, which I don't super like, um, but it's going to be pretty straightforward for the next guy um, or girl. Um, so, um, what's that? Oh yeah, you're saying this is pretty much how Go programmers do it now. That's been my experience so far. I don't know if anyone else has had a different experience. Um, but you know, like you could, there's a lot of stuff you could do to make this a little better. But ultimately, you're still accomplishing the same thing. You're just moving it around a little bit. This is like this is the essential complexity of the problem. Any other questions? Stringifying? Yeah, stringifying. There you go. Uh, so, I mean, that's doing not the same thing, but similar kind of idea, right? Generating code and placing it in the call template. Mm -hmm. um, so, in the absence of, of real generics, I mean, this, so this looks actually good to me. I, 
Okay. Actually something really similar. Cool. Um, and it's a huge time saver for us. I'm, I'm wondering like, where, where you came to the conclusion that like, this is a bad idea, don't uh, The place where I came to the conclusion is that, that, that you shouldn't use it um, is when um, we get to the part where um, I show someone the template. Um, and my, my templates start to get more and more complicated as you start to add more features. So like one of the things that I, I don't want to have to do with this is um, define a getter twice. Um, so like if all I want to do is get a value out of a document and I have a string available for the next step, um, I would call try with the document and have that thing return a string and that'll return an optional string and that's how I go to the next step. Um, generating stuff like that makes it way more complicated to do like the map from one type to another type. Um, and so I wind up doing stuff like um, if you download the source to this thing, um, my template function actually takes more arguments than just the type. You can give it like functions that you want to do a straight pass through that'll do like an asynchronous call through, um, stuff like that. When you start introducing those convenience methods, it starts to get um, pretty hairy as far as complexity and like reading and understanding stuff goes. Um, and so I guess I pursued it all the way to that point and gone, this is kind of too far. Um, yeah. Um, I suppose it would be reading the go that the DRBs generate. Okay. Um, it's not insanely complex. Well, it can't be more complex than DRBs. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not more. It's yeah. Be less complex. It must be. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, so one of the things that I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll specify pass through methods that you know do the getters asynchronously. Like I was saying before, um, and you can have a couple of those that map from one type to the next, um, and then you might have a bunch of arguments to your generation function. Um, and you know, any time that I like want to get a string out of a document, which in this use case is going to be all the time, um, I'm going to use that thing. And then any time I want to like convert a document to like an integer for an ID or convert to any kind of type, any kind of conversion you can do, it's going to be another function that goes into your in your generated code. Um, and you wind up with sort of um, stuff that makes sense from the perspective of the generation comment, but not so much from the perspective of the file. Like the file starts to look like your generated files start to look like. Yes, it's code that I could have written, but it's not really laid out how I would have laid it out. You know, um, you'll see like convert to this type, convert to that type, and then a getter method, and then convert to this type, and then a getter method for something else, and then convert to that type. And Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it saves like reading it, which is so much easier. Yeah. We, we could, uh, we don't, but yeah, we could. Um, that sounds like a great after talk okay. discussion to carry on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Do we have any other questions, though? Uh, it is, yeah. In, in my example, yeah. I am a strong proponent of using the best language for the job. Um, and so I'll use Go for performant low level networking stuff. You know, and if I need to do symmetric multiprocessing, something like that, if I need to like parse the syntax tree and generate something, I'll use Ruby or something else. You know. 
and I probably would have found that if I, yeah. Um, another part of the reason I didn't want to do that is because I would have two projects to compile now. I have to compile my generating stuff, and I have to make a tool to work the way that I wanted to do it. So I, I did actually make the tool that does the generation, um, and that's like ten lines of Ruby or something like that. And I felt like it was okay because I still got the same compile time protection against my stuff being right. Because if my generation is wrong, I just won't compile anyway. Um, Um, so they're not really generated on the fly. They're generated when you build. And they're actually not even generated as part of the go build command. Um, go generate, by default, you have to you have to call generate on the files that you want to generate. Um, and so the result is that you're basically in the same place you would be if you had written it yourself anyway. Um, it's just that you would do the generate step before you do any static analysis or anything else. Any other questions? Sure. Um, so I'll bring up the slide for that. If I can find it, there it is. Um, so best practices for the go generate command. Um, I can't. I didn't find a whole lot on this. Um, the number one practice that that seemed to be seems to be agreed on um, is that your consumers, if you're writing a library or something, your consumers should not have to run go generate. In fact, it should be transparent to them. Um, so, and that's why it's a different step than the go build command. Um, so, like, if I if I go get somebody's code, I'm, I'm expecting to get the generated version, not the version that has the templates in it. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, my understanding of it is that your generate tend to be pretty finicky, and you lose some of the protection you get with Go. So, if you have all this build protection around um, building the right thing, that means that the person who does the generation has to build it and make sure that it works. So, if somebody is consuming your library and they have to run Go generate. Um, they might encounter a problem with how the generation happened that you didn't anticipate, and they're kind of, you know, out of luck at that point. Um, so, if you have Go generate it, you want to generate it yourself. You don't want the people who use your library to generate it instead. Um, and then, besides that, there's just kind of a lot of gotchas. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people use it. I think because of the gotchas, um, like it's not clear that it's actually just running a command line tool. If you read the Go doc on it, it says it runs Go tool something, and it seems like it's Go specific, but it's actually, you know. It's just a command line execution. It's just in your shell. So that brings all of the um, shell execution problems that you might expect, like you know, if you're depending on the env variables or something like that. Um, how do those get there? You know, when are they set? Um, and um, and then even output, like um, this script that or this optional script. Um, nothing about the Go generate tool knows where the file should go. Like it doesn't know what file is being run from, and it doesn't know what file it should output to. Um, so my optional script just infers the name of the file you want from the type that you pass in. Um, there's no way to like introspect and say like, oh, I'm generating a document. I want to go on this thing. So if you like um, want to change your directory structure of your generated files or something like that, you really want your um, script to be able to handle that. You don't want to have to pass it as an argument. That's lots and lots of little, little gotchas like that. And I think that's why I haven't seen a lot of people using Go Generate. Sure. Uh, so, if you're using uh, a relative path method to go generate dot 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 dot, mm -hmm. do you know does that actually will work with a, a relative path? It works relative to the file it was run in. So, okay. Okay. yeah. Okay, so that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, the, the question before actually sort of uh, got to this was uh, if, if this was not a library that's being shared. Um, so he's asking, would I commit the generated code, or would I commit the generators, and and then if you're going to do the build? Right, the I, library makes sense one way. Yeah. Because someone for using your library would have to have loops installed. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I personally I would commit the generated code and not the generator for exactly the same reason. Like, um, you know, because you might not have Ruby installed everywhere, you might not have the tools installed anywhere, it might be finicky doing it, and ultimately like you might catch problems with your usage. Your compiler can catch problems with the usage that you're going to want to know about when you're generating the code and not later. Um, especially like if you're using continuous integration, if you're using concourse or something, you don't want to have to set that up to do generation step as well. You know, um, 
it would be neat if there is a way, I haven't investigated this, but to detect if your generation is up to date and then fail to build if it's not. Um, and say like, oh, hey, you forgot to run generate or something. It's your problem, you know. Um, it should be kind of cool. But as far as like actually doing the generation and then compiling and doing all the tests against it, not so hot on that. Oh, I know what you do, just uh, modify time. If the modify time of your generation script or template is greater than the modified time of your generated code, then maybe a git push hook or something like that. Yeah, we're getting kind of off in the weeds. Right. We should hang out later. <laughs> uh, more questions? What's up? So there's a really great argument on the front page of Hacker News like two weeks ago, um, actually while I was working on these slides. Um, generics have been proposed to go, that I know of, five times. Um, and every time there's been some like holes poked in the proposal um, that has been decided to be sort of not conducive to doing go the go way. Um, so my gut feeling is I don't have any more information than anybody who you know was on Hacker News last week. Um, but my gut feeling is that they're on the way, but who knows when. Um, if this last proposal goes through and everybody likes it, then it could be as early as next week. Um, if not, then it could be, you know, indefinite future, I don't know. Um, a lot of things are up for debate here, like um, to show an example of kind of the problems that you run into with generics and why it's like maybe slow coming. Um, I'm gonna hop back to the Swift example for a second. Um, so this is, this is a really trivial example, and, and I said, I kind of qualified this when I was talking about it. This is sort of generating a stack of integers, and if you were using it exactly like this, that's actually what it would be doing in Swift. But if you say, in Swift, you can, um, you can say that item conforms to uh, an interface, for example, um, and then if you did that, then it would actually do a compile time check against the energy being passed in and say it conformed to the interface, everything's great. But if the interface that you pass in itself is generic and has an associated type, Swift goes, I don't know what to do, and it falls back on not generating the code at compile time, and it actually um, constructs, it basically does the same thing you're doing with the empty interface before, but it does that at runtime now, and it doesn't tell you that it's opaque. Um, and that's the kind of thing that the proponents, or the opponents of generics in Go are wary of. Um, and so part of the argument is like, okay, if I can't say that the thing that I pass in here has, these are called, um, I don't figure what they're called, but the way to like narrow down exactly what the item type is going to be. Um, if I can't do that with the generic, then aren't I cutting off like half the functionality, half the reason to have generics in the first place? And if that's true, then why even do it? You could just use go generate. And so that's the state of the question as far as I understand it. Um, does that answer your question? Um, so if this um, is an item and there's a there's like a type qualifier I think it's called um, that um, the item has to conform to this interface and then that uh, that um, it's called a protocol so if that protocol itself has an associated type which is also generic um, you wind up with um, I think the Swift compiler just refuses to walk every walk the tree um, I think is the argument for it um, I don't quite. Theoretically, a compiler could do that, but um, Swift was recently embarrassed in Hacker News uh, when somebody wrote a literal dictionary that took 12 hours to compile. <laughs> um, and it's because Swift, the Swift compiler was doing type inference and it was doing it recursively. And so it did actually compile, it just took 12 hours. And so I think this is one of the cases where it's just like, nope, not doing that, sorry. Uh, and then you wind up with unexpected behavior at runtime, which is kind of a bummer. Does generate require shelling environment? I'm pretty sure it does, although um, I'm not speaking from experience. This is a gut feeling. I'm just based on my own usage of it. You probably could do Heroku, because Heroku has a transient file system you can actually access. Um, so as long as, if you didn't want to do this on Heroku, as long as you, you know, detected the tr gener generated file was there and if it's not regenerated, so as long as your action is like item potent, um, it probably would work on Heroku. Um, wouldn't work on something like Amazon Lambda, but Lambda doesn't support Go anyway, so. Yeah. 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 
I can get it. Um, so here's the source for this talk. I've got my template here, which is checked in, and that's pretty much like what you saw. I was copy and pasted from this file. And then um, if I jump back, and then here's one of the files that was generated. Um, and so this is a generated file, which is why the spacing is weird, and GoFund hasn't been run on it, because um, I didn't make that part of my build script. Um, but this is checked in, and so um, if you wanted to use any of this stuff, you would pretty much just pretend that it wasn't even generated. You wouldn't even have to know that it was generated. And same thing would happen with Heroku or whatever, is you, you would check in the generated stuff. Yeah. Um, I put it in main in this case, this tiny little thing. Um, so I just have the generate um, right there. It's just a comment. Um, the reason I put it in main is because I wanted it to be as simple as possible. I just go go generate and then main.go and I get all the generations that I would need. The original version of this had more stuff in it and I was, this is too complicated and I turned it down a little. Sure. <laughs> It'd be five dollars. Um, now this, this is all open source on GitHub. I've actually been meaning to put a license on it if anybody actually wants to use any of it. I put MIT on it or something. Um, yeah, so th uh, this is just Ruby. Um, we grab the first argument, which is document. Um, we infer that we want entities.document. Our odd file is going to be optional slash name.downcase. Um, and then the methods part is for those uh, call through methods I was talking about. So I want to have like an asynchronous version of a synchronous function. And so all the subsequent arguments are the asynchronous, fun asynchronous functions I want to make. Um, and then I just load up an ERB file. Um, get result with binding, so that just means make these variables available inside the template. Um, and then I open up the inferred out file and write the contents to it. Um, and then also iterate, do the same thing for all the methods that I was interested in delegating. The, the go stringer? Uh, sure. Probably. I'm not going to Google in front of everybody, though. That would be weird. Yeah. Uh, didn't have this ready. Wasn't expecting this question. Uh. Okay, I can't find it in three seconds, and I'm not going to stand here and Google while people are looking at me. That would be. Everyone else can Google. Yeah, you can Google. Look up the stringer, go generation stringer example. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about testing for your generator? Test for the generator and the code that gets generated. Um, so what I do and what I would do, I didn't actually do for this. Um, so you know, don't tell Pivotal. Um, <laughs> but what I would do if I was using this thing um, is Hopefully, I don't know if Ginkgo has shared examples. Um, I've only used GoTest before. Um, so like other behavioral f uh, testing frameworks similar to Ginkgo and Gomega um, have these things called shared examples. And a shared example is sort of a ger generified um, um, test example set. And so I would write um, a shared example set that matches the template and then include that in any in tests for the concrete types, um, if that makes sense. So I would almost have like, I would have the one template file that's generified, and then I'd have shared examples which are generified. And then when I make the concrete implementation, you'd get both. Um, so you'd get the concrete test for the concrete class. Um, the reason for that is um, there's a lot of stuff that I might want to do um, that I could do um, that would change functionality between the different optional types. Excuse me. Um, so like one example is like, 
um, if there's some specific use case that I'm, I'm doing a lot with one of these optionals and I, I want to like extend it or something like that, for whatever reason, I want to have something that's a little bit different from the generated version. Um, I would want my test to reflect that the implementa implementation has changed. And I would want that to happen for every example. So like another approach you could do is, and what I've seen done in similar cases other places, is um, someone will make like an abstract class just for the test example and then, um, you know, in this case I would maybe like generate an optional foobar and foobar is something only exists inside my test case um, and then just test that that does what I expect. The problem I have with that is that if any one of your other optionals differs from the template for any reason, it's going to blow up. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to sneak by your tests. Hypothetically, you should never run into that. If you're doing that, you're doing something even weirder than generating code in the first place. But in practice, I just sleep a little bit better if you know, it's actually tested somewhere. Um, and then as far as testing the, the generator, generator itself, um, you know, eh, like does it compile? Um, does the thing that it generates pass tests? If those things are true, what tests could I possibly write for the generator that, you know? Now, now if I had like a more elaborate generator than like, you know, syntax tree walking or something like that and like type inference or something, then maybe I would be interested in test driving that because it's gonna have a lot of stuff I can unit test, but ultimately like you got that one big honking integration step where you generate and compile and if that doesn't pass then you know something's broke. Does that, that answer your question? Anybody else? Alrighty. Thanks, Thanks everybody.